base class uh, is is all about running the, our latent variable models backwards um, and to go back from the scores to the original data or to go back from the y variables in PLA <coughs> to the original x's. Uh, but to get us there, I, I wanted to cover this smallish topic of multivariate characterization first because it leads naturally into what we're going to head, head towards at the end, which is the product development, which is where we actually run the models backwards. The multivariate characterization also does that, but it's a little easier to understand this step first, and then the next step is, is easy after that. So what multivariate characterization does is it addresses a particular problem that comes up quite a few times in, in, in companies. Not every day, it's not a regular thing that comes up, but when it happens, it's extremely important to do it right because you can make a lot, you can waste a lot of money doing it wrong. Or conversely, you can really get to where you want to be much faster than following the usual approach. So what we're looking at here is, is for example, when a company wants to select a new catalyst to develop a particular product or a pilot plant study, they need to select a catalyst to help in their reaction to produce this particular chemical D. Now they can go onto the market and look at various suppliers for these catalysts and, and they'll find easily 50, 60 potential different catalysts, say 10 from one supplier, 12 from another supplier. Every supplier has a whole family of particular products that they uh, also, uh, materials or catalysts that they can provide for you. So how do you select from all of those? Or if you need a surfactant to blend with your product, to um, like for example, this pro this example comes from my company. Uh, I didn't do any work like this, but I presume up in the higher level of the company where they do the product design, they would face the similar issue. They need to select a particular surfactant so they can blend it in with the product so that that final blend has certain properties, perhaps a particular viscosity or, uh, or uh, spreadability that it needs. So that choice of surfactant is, is, is difficult. There's so many different surfactants out there, all with various ways that they will interact with the product that we're blending it with. So there's some chemistry involved with how that surfactant interacts with the blend. And it's not clear how that how that will work out at the end. So do you just brute force go try all these all these particular surfactants? You you speak to your suppliers and you ask them to send you samples. They, they're very happy to send you samples for free. And you can easily land up with 50, 60 different samples that you now have to go test. Okay? So the problem what we're faced with here is how do we choose a small grouping, a small list of contenders, these are potential candidates from a list of a larger set. Okay? Well, the case study we'll work through a little bit here is if I've got 103 solvents, how do I pick a few of those solvents so that I can continue on with my experiments? I obviously don't want to test all 103, but I want to test just a few, but I want to make sure that those few are representative of the global pool of some of the solvents I have available. And so the way we address this problem is by breaking it down a little bit. We start off by asking, how can we characterize those solvents? How can we describe the solvents? And then once we have a description of, of the solvents, we can look at picking a few of them. So for example, we would expect hexane and heptane, they're right next to each other in terms of their structure, C6 and C7. If we had to pick from 103 solvents, of which these were two potential candidates, we likely wouldn't pick both of them. We would pick one of them because if we use C6, the results we're going to get from C6 are likely very similar to the results we get from C7. Okay. So the problem we're, we're asking to in this section is how do we select a few samples that span the space of all available samples? That's the key point. So we want to make sure we don't miss out on any solvent that might be interesting, but we don't want to go work on all 103 of them either to try and uh, solve this problem. So the, the approach is as follows. Identify as many candidates as you possibly can. And for each one of them, get their physical properties. Or not just their physical properties, but perhaps if this is an interaction of the solvent with the other product that you're blending the solvent with, you might want to find out information about how that solvent interacts. Um, but basically what we want to get is as much easily available information as possible. 
So all these can be looked up on internet databases or in, in chemistry reference manuals. Uh, very, very straightforward to get this sort of information. Spectroscopic scans even are freely available on the internet for many, for many compounds. What you'll find though is you'll have a lot of missing data when you assemble this matrix. So we're assembling a matrix where we've got in this direction here, we've got candidates. So this is one row, represents one particular solvent, the next row represents another solvent, and in the columns, we have the various properties that we measure on that solvent. Now, it's likely that when we go to one supplier, they will give us all the properties we need. So suppliers love to give you information, they like to give you free samples, but if you go, let's say, get sample one, two, and three from one particular supplier, they will measure a certain group of properties and give that to you. Then you go to your next solvent, four, five, and six, that supplier will give you many of the same properties, but they'll give you a few others that the first supplier didn't give you. And so you'll end up with this matrix, which is got most of your data assembled, but for many of your properties, you'll have missing values. You don't want to really spend money on just yet finding out those missing values. So what we'll do is we don't really care because we're going to build a PCA on that, this matrix, which can handle missing data. So build a PCA model on this matrix with as many rows as we've got candidates, as many columns as we've spent our time and effort collecting that data. So the number of columns is totally dependent on our choice and how much work we prepare to do. Okay. And uh, this solvent database is available for you. It's 103 rows on, I think, eight or nine columns. So you can, you can get that uh, from that website there. And when you build a PCA on that, you'll see it's, it's got, uh, I forget the R squared explained for this particular data set, but it, 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 it's well explained. And I'm just looking at the first two components here. And, and what's interesting is how well spread the data is through that T1, T2 space. Now, heptane and hexane, they do fall very close together. Um, I, 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 you can go prove it to yourself. Uh, I forget exactly where the two are, but I think there's something like heptane and hexane, they're right there. And that makes sense. Those two solvents are very similar to each other from a chemical point of view. So in this universe of the 103 solvents we're considering, they should be close together. Then what we do after that is we can follow one of three approaches. These first uh, A and C are very similar. Um, what we do is we look at those 103 solvents and we pick using a DOE type strategy, design of experiment strategy, we select a smaller number of solvents. In this case, I've picked five. You can pick eight or seven or however many you want. I picked these five because they span the space well. They cover the full range. So what we've done is we've converted our eight variables here. I think we have roughly eight variables. Let's say we measured all of these on the solvents uh, other than the spectroscopic scan. So all those first uh, ones are measured on the solvents. We converted those eight variables in our, in our X matrix over to two new variables, T1 and T2, that are independent of each other and capture the original information from the eight. So this is straightforward PCA. And then we've gone and done a DOE in T1 and T2. So rather than do a DOE in property one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and build the two to the eight factorial, which is 64 experiments, We've now gone and done the two to the two plus the center point DOE over here and given us five experiments. And these five data points should cover all the information that we would have gotten from the full data set. Especially considering, it, it makes so much sense if you, if you take a look at melting points and, and boiling points as an example. These two variables are so highly correlated with each other. They move up and down together for all the solvents. So it doesn't make sense to include both of those. If we were going to do a DOE in the original variables, the eight variables, it wouldn't make sense to do a DOE in both melting point and boiling point because the, the, all the solvents, they move those two values move up and down together, perfectly correlated almost. So doing a DOE in a reduced dimensions space here, 
T1, T2 makes, makes a lot more sense. The other approach you can use is a, is a bit more, more um, ad hoc. You select the observations manually so that they just cover the space well. The problem we sometimes face with trying to do a DOE is that we don't always find a data point exactly where we need it. Right? So imagine if I didn't have a solvent over there in that corner, I wouldn't be able to do my DOE in, in the usual orthogonal type manner. So um, here I was lucky doing that. But if I, let's say I didn't have that particular data point over there, I would just pick the next one over. And so I wouldn't have quite a balanced DOE, but it's, it's still okay. I'm still spanning the space of all available uh, solvents to me. The advantage of this ad hoc approach is that uh, if there's a constraint in your um, system, for example, these solvents over here are very, very reactive and maybe explosive, so you don't want to even consider those solvents. That's okay, you just put a constraint through there and I've drawn a line artificially, uh, so most of these solvents up to, this, up to that side of the line are not suitable candidates. We would then just select so that we still span the space but obey that constraint. So it's a very manual approach and nothing wrong with it at all. You, it, it's a nice approach because you can, you can add in soft constraints like, um, like this particular line there or there may be other reasons why you want to eliminate certain points. Let's say this solvent over here was eliminated because it's, it's very expensive so you know that it's not even a candidate to test. So this is, that's what's nice about this manual approach take these extra The final uh, choice is really just takes both of these two approaches and formalizes them a little bit. Deoptimal designs. How many of you are aware of deoptimal designs? Or just one or two of you? So deoptimal de designs are basically the way they work is as follows. Let's I just put up a few notes here. What the deoptimal design does is it would look at those those values of T1, T2, and T3. Let's, let's say we had three scores. So we've got T1, T2, T3, and we have 103 rows over here with the T1, T2, and T3 value for each of them. So 103 by three matrix. And what a deoptimal design does is it uses what's called a candidate exchange algorithm to select a certain number of points. You specify that I would like n equal to, let's say, 9. Because your experimental budget that your boss has given you, you can handle 9 experiments. That's all the money you have available. So you tell the optimal design, select for me 9 rows from these 103, so that those 9 rows span the volume of T1, T2, T3 maximum. So it will select those nine rows to obey that um, objective function. And as you can see here, what it does quite nicely is that if I've got more than two components, more than T1, T2, this is a better approach, right? If I had only, uh, if I had three components, trying to do this manual selection or even this in three dimensions gets really tough to do. But a deoptimal design doesn't really care because you just give it the columns, you might have here as well. In, in that case, it, it just goes. You just go re, redo the uh, candidate exchange up here. You say, well, hang on now. I've got four variables. Select for me nine experiments so that those four variables span the volume in a maximum way. And the other nice thing about the optimal designs are you can give them constraints. So if you know that there's certain regions that you don't want to operate in, you can tell that the optimal design to ignore those those particular observations. So it's a more structured approach to getting uh, the same result. Just one other point here, I put a note up here. When you collect your data, so that was, remember, step one here was to, uh, step one and two, identifying your candidates and collecting your data. It's sometimes worth including into the, that data set observations that you know will not be suitable. So you may know already um, that they're too expensive or too reactive or really hard to get from the, from the supplier. But it doesn't matter because we put them in anyway. What they help is to make that PCN matrix span the space 
more evenly and they go into all the directions that we will consider. Okay, so don't prejudge the result by eliminating observations. Keep them in and those PCA directions will get added to the model. You can always go use constraints to avoid selecting those observations later on, but they will help uh, stabilize the PCA model. Okay, so there's quite a bit more you can go read about this in these two references. They're pretty old references, but it's, uh, it's, it's surprising how few companies actually use this sort of idea, which is so simple, it's just a PCA on, on a data set. Uh, so so it's, it's worth looking at. Any, any questions? Uh, the other reference I would also recommend is the book by Swanty Wall at Numetrics. Uh, it's available in the library as, as a two volume book and one of the chapters is on this multivariate design. I think there's a link on it on the website under, under the literature section. If not, uh, email me, I can, I can tell you where it is in the library. Okay. So that's not where it ends though. What we do after we select these few experiments, so in one case we, we selected a, a fewer number of observations from the 103 available to us. What we go do then is we take those, those solvers, those, those, those observations, and we do our experimental work with them. So if we're developing a catalyst in the pilot plant, we would go use those N samples and calculate our quality variables. Maybe it might, it could be percent conversion of the raw material or purity of the product that we're trying to produce uh, or, or more, more than those. So those two are just an example, but there could well be others. And we're assembling here basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take and build a PLS is where we're heading with this. So we're going to build an X matrix with just a very few number of rows. So N equal to the number of numbers selected and why are the quality variables that we're interested in. So in this case of the catalyst we've got those two quality variables. In the case of the surfactant there could be things like the viscosity of the blend, uniformity, stability and so on. And we build a PLS model that relates that X and that Y space to each other. What we then go do is we take the rest of the solvents that we didn't do our experiments on and those become testing data. So there's many, many more rows here now in X test. And we use those to get the same Y hats. Then we've got pretty good confidence that these testing predictions should be pretty good because even though we haven't done these experiments to measure Y, we know that these X's originally span the space of all potential solvents quite well. So it should be that these X's that are in our testing data set are actually interior to the training data. So the training data were perhaps the, were these points here in blue. All of our testing data are the other points in black. They're interior to the points we built the model from. So it should be that the predictions from this particular PLS model are, are quite good. And once we see those, those Y hats, there might be something interesting showing up on them. For one is, there might be some, a particular row from this prediction that gives us really outstanding performance, much better than the few rows that we originally selected over here. Okay. So we get a particular row X test, and its corresponding Y hat. That's really good, great performance, good, good viscosity, uniformity, and product stability, or in this case of the chemical, really high purity. It was much higher than any of the other uh, uh, rows over here where we actually did the work on. We can then go take this X test and request a, a sample from the supplier and do the experiment to verify that that prediction is, is in, in fact what we think it is. It may also be that sometimes you get a Y hat over here that's exactly what you're looking for. And then you go ahead and use that then as your candidate for future, for future test work. 
So what this what we've done over here is we've eliminated doing experiments on all these 103 solvents. We've gone down to maybe eight or nine where we've actually done the work on. So much faster time, uh, much less uh, cost to do the work. And we should land up picking the ideal solvent for our case that we would have picked up had we done the experiments on all 103. Okay. So this will be a common theme in today's class for product development. It's not that these tools are any better than the, than the normal tools, but what they will do for you is they will save you a huge bunch of time to get to probably the same result that you would have with traditional methods. Yeah. So that's, that's something like building like a simple model for complex model, right? So Except we don't have the complex model. We don't have all hundred we don't we haven't done the work on all hundred and three solvents to build a PLS model on hundred and three rows. Yeah, but it would be beneficial if we had like replicates of the of the number of points where I have it. Replicates in the score space and or from, in the, from the end you're choosing, right? From from which point you're choosing. If you choose it twice, would it be helpful? Uh, what I would do if I really wanted to go to re replicates, I would pick replicate points in my score space rather than my original space. So rather than running the experiment on heptane twice, if I see heptane here that's right next to hexane, I'll probably run heptane and hexane. Because you're just going to get you're going to get more in information that way, right? Potentially. Uh, if you're just running an experiment on, on the same data point twice, all you're proving to yourself is how well you're able to run experiments. Right, so you're just going to get this. You're going to get a Y for one for one row. Say this row and this row are duplicates of each other in X space. You're going to get a Y here and a Y here that's similar but different. And that the, the difference is due to the laboratory error and your experimental error. So you're not really learning anything from those two new rows other than how well you're able to do experiments and how well you're able to reproduce your your lab results. I would much rather spend my budget, which is usually very, very limited in these examples, on picking other new, new data points. In fact, if I had my way, I wouldn't pick these two points close together. I would rather then put in center points over here. Right? You see, the biggest thing that companies face is that there is a mandate usually to get your product developed and get it ready so that you can start selling it because someone from the marketing or the sales team has determined there's a need for this. So the longer it takes you to get to that point, you're gonna miss out on sales, or you're gonna have the potential that your competitor's going to get there before you. And so I, I would want to get to the, this end point with as few experiments as possible so, so I can save both the time of doing the experiments, but also I get, get to market faster than, than my competitors. Now, uh, any questions on that before we move on? The, what you'll often find is that it's not as smooth sailing as I've shown here. Like this is a very nice example where, our, where the scores, the 103 solvents we've selected, span the space quite well. There's no real gaps. But in many cases, there are gaps or holes in that score space. So we'll often find, find these holes. And the question then is, well, if there's this hole, let's say that hole for that score location is tau nu. So this is a standard terminology I'll use throughout today's class. <coughs> We've got a particular location in the score plot that's not filled in. And let's say that location is T1 nu, T2 nu, up to TA nu. <coughs> we're asking now, we're going backwards here, what would be the characteristics of the X's that would land up with a score value in that t tau location. So find x nu that will give you a tau that's pretty close to, to where you, uh, to that hole that you want to fill up. Okay, so one thing you can go do is you can just go arbitrarily change your x values. And to say this, I should be a little bit more specific. I'm not just randomly going around changing my x values. We already know, we've got our loadings plot. We can use our loadings plot to help us say where we should move to get a corresponding score value. We've all looked at our loadings plots and we've seen that values with higher values of P1, if we move them up, we'll get a higher T1. So we've got some guidance as how to get to a new score location. But this is very much 
just a trial and error approach. And I'll demonstrate this for you in some software in a minute. The next approach here is much more um, specific. It actually uses the fact that we've got a model for our X space. So both for PCA and PLS, we have models for our X space. It says our X predicted, X hat is T times P. Okay. All that's saying from a mathematical point of view is project, projecting back onto the model plane, we get X hat. This was the equation we looked at last week, remember, when we compared ordinary least squares to the Lipel's algorithm. We're doing exactly the same here. Our best prediction of a row in X is taking the score and, and multiplying it by the row least P. And what will happen is for this observation, uh, for this X hat, is it will be right on the model plane. It says P will be zero. Okay. So, I see a few confused faces, so let me try to explain it this way. We're going from, what's, what's happening in this particular illustration, I'll use, I'll use P, PCA. We have an X matrix and our score matrix T. We're saying, I've got a new location here, tau nu. What is the corresponding X new? So we all, we're quite comfortable going this way and saying T new is X new times P. Okay? But we can also go backwards by saying by using this particular equation is one particular way to go backwards. But it, it makes sense that there's multiple ways to go backwards. So the case is we've got one, two, up to capital A values over here in town new. So let's let's give it let's give it a concrete number. Let's say we have three components. And we want to find one, two, up to capital K, in other words, let's give it a concrete value of 8. We want to find the 8 x's in our original space that gets us as close to the 3 scores where we want to be. We know our T1, T2, T3 values. We specify them ourselves based on where we want to be in the score space. What are the 8 x's that gets us to that tower? There's an infinite number of choices because it's, it's an underspecified problem. Or well, we've got five degrees of freedom, basically. If we had three variables here in X and three score values that we want to achieve, we've got a square system. Three unknowns, three equations. We can solve this equation here. Three unknowns, three equations to get our particular values of tau. Okay. If, if I can make this a bit more uh, approachable to you, it would be nothing more than saying, Ax equals b that you learned from linear algebra in first year or second year. Basically what this is, it's saying b is equal to a times x. Just flipping it around. So I'm basically solving ax equals b. So if you've got an underdetermined equation system, you've got, uh, sorry, underdetermined system of equations, you've got fewer equations than unknowns. Overdetermined equation set is when you've got more equations than unknowns. In this particular case, we're underdetermined. We've got eight potential variables we can adjust to get these three over here. We've got five degrees of freedom we can move around. So it makes absolute sense that there's an infinite number of values of x nu we can pick to get to the desired values of tau. If we add this constraint that this x hat must be on the model plane, that's a pretty big constraint. What it does is it forces X hat to be on the model plane. It forces a unique solution. So I will I will look at this also from an optimization point of view because as if all this all this talking about degrees of freedom, I'm using that terminology specifically because all these problems we're going to look at today can be reshaped into optimization problems. So. Let's, let, me, let me try to illustrate this with a, an actual example. We looked at the food texture data set 
at the start of this course. Remember, this was the data set where we had a number of pastries. And for each of the pastries, we had five variables measured. It's oiliness, it's crispiness, hardness, density, and fracturability. Now, for this, for this discussion that I'm going to have right now, let's assume we can adjust oiliness, crispiness, hardness, density, and fracturability directly. Let's say I have a way that I can uni univariately adjust each one of these and I can get them to exactly where I want them to. That, that in practice is obviously hard, but for this particular uh, discussion, it, it doesn't really matter, but for now we'll assume we can do that. Now, I'm going to use this example that we're noticing there's this region here in the score space that's really got no particular pastry in it that we've ever produced before. And so the question we're asking is, for a value at t1 equals 0.5 and t2 minus 1.5, so roughly over there, what would be the conditions of the oiliness, crispiness, hardness, density, and fracturability of that pastry so that my score value lands up in that, in that location? Okay. So let me take a look at it this way. Here's that same, same space. And uh, so it would be really helpful if you have open next to you this particular loading plot. Unfortunately, I've got limited space on my screen. adjust the five variables. Okay. And right now, all five variables are at their mean, the mean value of oiliness, density, crispiness, and so on, so that that red point is at the model center. Also, that point is right on the model plane. SPE is equal to zero. The 99% limit of SPE in this case study is roughly three. So an SPE above three is far away from the model plane. So I'm going to ask you, what what should I change in my five data points so that I get that red point over here, at minus 1.5, uh, sorry, at my, at, yeah, plus 0.5 for T1 and minus 1.5 for T2. What would be the first variable you would adjust if you looked at the loadings? So there's the loadings over there. Yeah, Jake. Decrease hardness. Decrease hardness. How far? So that's one particular way of getting there, and, and that has an SP of, one, of 0.98. Okay. So let's revert back to the center point, and let's try a different way. Okay, so someone else. Increase oil. Sorry? Increase oil. Increase oiliness. Okay. And then if I want to move over to the left, increase or decrease oil? <laughs> okay, so we've landed up roughly at the same location but using a total different set of, of, uh, of x variables. So it's a total non-unique solution. And this particular solution we've landed up has an SP of, of 1.88. So it's, it's, yes, it's at this location in the small space, but it's further off the model plane. Okay. There is only one set of, of x variable combinations that have SPE exactly equal to zero, and that is the set of, SP, of x values when 
you say, take my score value that I want, multiply by the loadings of the model, and it will get me my x hat. Okay? Now, I can go do that calculation, and I can implement it, I can prove it to you, but what, this is actually one feature that is built in into the course software, so I'll show you where this is, so you can try it out in the future. So here I've built my PCA model on the data set. I think there's, yeah, there's two components, and we're trying to aim for that point on the model plane. So the software will do that for you by using what's called Model Explorer under the Model menu. And what you do is the same thing as, as I just did here, except this time we move our small value around. And as I move that small value around, we want it, you notice know, it's changing up the top over there, the top over there. I want 0.5 and I want minus 1.5. Okay, so that's roughly where I want it to be. And what it's telling me, I click create new point, it's telling me what the oiliness, density, crispy fracture hardness are to get that point on the model plane. So that, that's the point with SPE exactly equal to zero. If I go back to this other software and I type, type in 18.37, that's the model plane. Density was 2766.8 and crispy 11.45, fracture 21.33. Notice how my SPE value is coming down and down and down, and then 94.45. So that gets me exactly where I want with an SPE of zero. It's only a single data point in the original X space that, that can do that for us. Every other combination of the X's will always be all from model plane, even though you get the same T1, T2. Okay, so what it, this was just a little graphical illustration of going from a lower dimensional space, T1, T2, T3, up to a higher dimensional space. We've got excess degrees of freedom. And the moment, any time you have excess degrees of freedom, you immediately can write to this optimization problem and try to constrain those degrees of freedom to get at some sort of optimum. Okay. The other, I, I was going to leave this as a as something that you can try for homework. You can go take point B seven five eight uh, or point thirty six in the slides over here. So this is. Point B758 if you use the data set off of the website, or point 36 if you look at just the slide, and try to reproduce the T1, T2 values for point 36. Okay. Try to reproduce for yourself, ask yourself what are the X values that would get the same T1, T2 values as that point. And then once you have those X values, you can go compare them to the original X values for point 36 and see how close you, you, you got. Okay? So, so I will leave that for you to try out on your own with the course software and verify that you can duplicate that. So what I just showed you here, both in the software or, or um, by the equations, is what's often called the, um, the what if simulation. So you're asking what if I change my x's? What is the effect on my scores, t? And it's not really a good procedure at all. I, Many times when, when I uh, teach this course to companies especially, the, one of the first questions they ask just after seeing PCA is this sort of question. They ask, well, what if I change my X's? How does it affect the scores? But they don't often think about it as, as a change on the model plane because what will happen is the moment I start changing these X's, I, I will invariably break the correlation structure between those X's, especially if I'm doing what I showed you here where I was changing the x's independently of each other. I was just moving the, one of these variables around at a time. I don't, when I do that, I'm not respecting the correlation structure in the data set. Because crispiness, if I start to move it left and right, it is correlated with some of the other variables in the data set. And so that other variable is correlated with should also be moved. Okay. If I don't move crispiness with the other variable, that's when I start getting high SPE values. Okay, so you cannot just say, 
what if I just move variables around independently? When variables are moved around to try and achieve a certain target, you have to move them in such a way that you maintain the correlation structure that was there between those variables originally. That's the key point for, for this whole class today, is movement in the, of the original variables must be done so that you maintain the correlation structure between the variables. Okay. So what I'll just end off here with is two, three slides, and then we'll take a break, is I'll show you how we can write this as an optimization problem. So how many of you are taking the 700 level optimization course? Most of you here in the front. Uh, for those of you that don't, uh, that are going to graduate without ever taking an optimization course, I strongly suggest that you try to get an optimization course into your program before you leave. You will not regret it. Because you'll always see that these sorts of, not just to understand this material, but for your general engineering career, it will be super beneficial to understand how to use optimization. It's so powerful here. What we're going to do in today's class, I'm going to look at a lot of these problems from an optimization perspective. This particular problem we just considered now can be written as an optimization, a very, very simple optimization. It says, I want to find x nu. Okay, so that's my search variable. I'm going to, I'm going to adjust the values in x nu, or the software is going to adjust it for me so that I achieve a certain objective function. My objective function is this one over here. Phi is this scalar value. This is a scalar that says, take the desired tau that I want. So I specify that value. For my EG, I would say, I want tau desired to be 0.5 and minus 1.5. I specify that value right, based on the fact that I want a, a new observation in that order. Tau desired is something I specify. The actual tau that I'm going to land up with, the actual scores that I'm going to get, is tau nu. And I'll describe that in a minute. So I want to minimize the difference between what I want and what I'm going to get. In other words, the error. So transpose times itself makes the sum of squares of the errors in that vector. So that's nothing more than saying minimize the sum of squares of the error between what you want and what you're going to get. What I'm going to get to tau is just my standard equation up here. Tau is p times x. Okay, it's this equation over here. So I've got. Uh, let me just write it correctly with the transposes. So tau nu is equal to p transpose x nu. The reason why I'm using uh, this notation is because p is uh, p transpose is a times k matrix. X nu is a k by one vector, so that you're going to land it with an a by one vector of scores. So finding my a score values by adjusting the k values of x. So it's going to adjust my k values, maybe k is 8 in this example, so that I find these three score values uh, for tau. Okay. And because this is such a simple uh, optimization function, you can actually solve it by hand. You don't need to actually code it up in, in optimization program like GANs or MATLAB. So if we substitute T nu into this equation over there, take the derivatives of the objective function with respect to the search variables, x nu, those are the search variables in this example, set that equal to zero. These are eight equations in this particular case, if, if k is equal to eight. Okay. Solve those equations and you'll find that the solution by hand is x nu is p times t. And that will be the minimum. Okay, so that's exactly the same solution that I had up here earlier. X is equal to P times T, or X transpose is T transpose times P transpose. It's not identical, I just got the transpose in there. So this is one way to prove that that very simple example earlier is just an optimization problem. So we're going to use this concept in all of today's class. We're always going to set an objective for what we want to achieve. In this case, we wanted to get a score value that was as close to the one we wanted. We're going to manipulate certain variables, x nu, in this case. These are called our search variables. And when we do this optimization, it's always going to be subject to a set of constraints. In this particular case study, uh, in this particular example, rather, the, the constraints were equality constraints that just came from the equation that describes the model. 
this case, this equation just describes what a PCA model is. So when we get the solution to this optimization problem, we know it's going to be, it's going to obey the PCA model from which it comes. So let's step it up a little bit by adding in some constraints. So I had a basic equality constraint up there, but let's take a look at, at a more practical, this is a real case study. And the other thing that's different from this to the previous one is we're going to go from P, PCA to PLS. So we're going to add in constraints and we're going to change our model from a PCA model to a PLS model. So in this particular example, the purple points represent the product produced by a particular company. And the points in green with red squares around them represents their competitor's product. So these are the properties of their product, the purple points, their competitor's product in green. And what this company wanted to do is they wanted to land up at a particular point in the center of their competitor's product. In other words, they want to create a product that matches their competitors. Their competitor is busy selling a product that they can't produce right now. How do I produce something that my competitor is producing? Well, I go buy some of my competitor's samples, I subject it to the same set of tests that I subject my samples to here in pink, or uh, red, purple, and I've got a constraint though. I can change things in my process, but I, I cannot adjust variable B, and I cannot adjust variable E. Okay. So the difference from the previous case was in the previous case we were saying adjust x nu, the entire vector of x can change. In this case, no, we, we cannot change every single element in x. We can only change, um, in this case I've got six elements, I can only change four of those six to achieve my target. So variables b and e are, are taken out of the model or out of the system. So all we do is we write out, uh, we write this as an objective function for, for an optimization again. Same as before, I want to get to this desired point that happens to represent my competitor's product. This is the actual value I'm going to land up with. So I want to minimize that error between what I want and what I'm going to get. What I'm going to get comes from the PLS model. So notice this is the, the difference from last time. T nu is equal to W star this time times x. Previously for PCA, T is equal to x times P or P times x. In this case it's W star times x. And in addition, I add two constraints to my optimization. I set x nu for, the, for b and x nu for e. I fix those to whatever values I fix them to. I, I choose those, okay? So this particular company, they could not vary b and e because they needed to be fixed at certain values. They fix them, and what that does is it actually reduces the size of your problem. So instead of varying six variables, a, b, c, d, and e, and f, we now vary A, C, D, and F. B and E drop out, so we reduce our degrees of freedom from six down to four. Okay. And the only other thing we've done differently is we've interchanged this equation that defines the model. For PCA, we say that tau nu is equal to P times X. For PLS, we just change the, the P to W star. And again, this result will lie on the model plane. X nu will be on the model. Okay, uh, any questions on that before we take a break here? Yeah. Good. Uh, depends on the model. It's a, when you can model, what the PC model is not fitting the data. Good uh, point. Yeah. You are, this obviously assumes that our model is capable of describing the data points that we've built it from, right? So in, this, in the case of this competitor's example, it wouldn't help inverting a model that, that explains the data pretty poorly. You have to have a model that does a reasonable job of explaining the data set. For the good side, you say you work more for a higher number of insular components, then the accuracy will be higher. But I don't say they like uh, sort of like you know, like uh, start to be higher than that. Absolutely. So yeah, what Shalesh is saying, yeah, you can go force in additional components so you get a better model explanation. But you really, if if you're just adding in and fitting noise, when you do the model inversion, you're just going to get garbage back out again, right? because your original model doesn't explain explain that the source data very well. So what we do is, when we build our model, uh, before we even go to the inversion side, 
we, we do cross validation, or you do even just testing set validation. You leave a set out and make sure that the model is capable of predicting these data points. And the other thing that one should always do when you do this uh, model inversion is actually try it on a data point that you know the tau value for already. Um, pick any tau value, let's say one over here, and say I know what that T1, T2 value is, and you know what the, the corresponding A, B, C, D, E, and F values were to get there, and you try it out and see if the model inversion actually works. So that, that's exactly what I was asking you here to do here for homework. So go try it out on this particular point because you know what the, the actual X is. You can just go look at the raw data and see. Okay. So go try the model inversion and see that you can get what the raw data says. Any other? Problem, right? If we were to code that up, that's a nonlinear problem? Because it's, it's got a quadratic uh, uh, objective function. Okay, both these two, this one is trivially solvable on paper, and yeah. it's, uh, it's obviously a quadratic objective function. This one here, also a quadratic objective function, it takes a, a lot more paper, like it's two or three pages of paper derivation by hand to prove, but it's also solvable actually algebraically without actually resorting to optimization, which which is really helpful to, uh, if you're going to implement this in software because then you can get a really fast answer without actually running an optimization. But, um, but we could have constraints saying like, you know, the x value must be greater than some other given inequality or... Then, or then, then you have to solve this optimization. But even just fixing two x's or however many equality constraints just <coughs> can both reduce the size of your problem but, and still be solved in the Okay, so let's take a break and then we'll